Good morning and welcome to the BBA's webinar on the rise of the CISO, delivered in partnership with BBA associate members, Templar executives. Today, to discuss the rise of the CISO, I'm delighted to be joined this hour by Andrew Fitzmaurice, CEO of Templar Executives, and Edward Walton, Deputy CEO of Templar Executives. Just before I hand over to Andrew, I'd like to invite you to participate in this webinar by asking questions. If you have a question for the presenters, you can ask a question at any time simply by clicking on the Ask a Question button on your screen, which is located underneath the presentation. Please note that when you ask a question, your name and your organization is not disclosed to any other webinar attendees. We intend to present for 40 minutes and then answer your questions for the remaining 20 minutes. Andrew, over to you. Hello, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, the first thing we'll just get out of the way, is it CISO or CISO? Well, for this uh, purpose of this presentation, we're going to call it a CISO, although I know it is a hot topic amongst some of you. Uh, just going to move on and talk about uh, the agenda for today. Uh, after some uh, brief introductions, my colleague, uh, Ebert Walton, is going to talk a little bit more about what we're going to cover in terms of the uh, the CISO role. And, and then hopefully at the end of this, we're going to have some very good uh, question and answer sessions. I believe there's about 20 minutes per side. But please, as Philip said, if you want to uh, ask questions as we go through, uh, please do so. And I'm now going to hand over to Edward to uh, talk a little bit more about the rise of the CISO. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, this morning, we're going to be talking, uh, not repeating uh, the many messages you will have heard and read about over the years and over the months and over the recent weeks even about the cyber threat landscape uh, increasing. Uh, that's uh, becoming a, a tried and tested path for many organizations to use the, the tactics of fear to try and spread the messages around this. What we're going to be talking about today is the uh, organizational role of the CISO in organizations, particularly, of course, in financial institutions today, uh, and really drawing on Tempera's experience of working with central bank CISOs, uh, national and international bank CISOs, and other CISOs across the financial services industry, because there are so many interrelated areas of interest and, indeed, discipline. Uh, there are, of course, growing regulatory and compliance issues for, for organizations in this space. Uh, national and local uh, compliance regulatory bodies are, uh, uh, are cracking down on, uh, on the issues around cyber security, uh, which is a term which has come to, to cover all sins. Uh, cyber means one thing to one organization and another thing to individuals therein. Uh, so it is necessarily a, a, a large topic to cover. And in the space of 40 minutes, we're not uh, understandably going to cover it all. The key thing uh, from our experience and working with the BBA and others is that organizations really need to be on the front foot in this area, understanding, identifying, uh, and understanding the threats that they face, the risks that are consequent to those, and the issues that come up as a result of some of those risks when those risks are realized. So really, the, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, is a role that really is uh, a C-level uh, role. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about where he or she sits in organizations in generic terms uh, at the moment, and indeed where that's going, hence the title, The Rise of the CISO. So let's move on now uh, and talk about uh, the next subject area. Over to Andrew. Hello. Um, we will just quickly touch upon Templar. Templar has been around for about uh, 10 years. Um, and you know, why and what are our credibility uh, in this space to be able to come and talk to you about it today? Well, uh, for us, we've been involved in sort of national strategies all around from about two, 2007 to the current one, which will hopefully come out after Brexit. Well, it may need to be changed a little bit, of course, depending on the outcome. Um, and uh, we offer uh, independent, world-class um, audits and health checks around cybersecurity maturity models. We have a world-class cyber academy uh, where and the majority of our courses are certified by GCHQ. And uh, again, world-class in terms of providing advisory uh, in this space. Just coming back to the national strategy, our current one, the 2011 one, gives sort of a bit of a clue of where we're going here because it is an actual fact for those who have managed to read it and understand it is, is a business strategy. It's more about cybersecurity as a business proposition rather than as a security proposition. So as we, as we see how the CISO could, could evolve, we see this starting to evolve very much as a uh, business role. I'm now going to hand over to Edward to talk a little bit more about the threat landscape. Thank you, Andrew. So we're going to, uh, to talk briefly about the, the, the global threat, uh, notwithstanding what I said earlier, really the, the necessity of the CISO to understand the nature of the threat 
how the uh, vulnerabilities of organizations is growing as more and more uh, of us as consumers, be it uh, uh, consumers of online banking or indeed of, uh, of retail shopping or, or many other areas and services which are delivered online, uh, whilst the great opportunities presented by this changing nature of how we do business and how we live our lives uh, is a great thing and a great benefit to us in time-saving convenience and much else besides, there are inevitably a growth in, in the vulnerabilities in, in doing that particular area. And then we're also going to touch briefly now on the limitations of response, uh, where criminals are uh, getting away with it, if you like. Uh, and I uh, hesitate to say this, but we really are unfortunately losing battles left, right and center against criminals who are uh, subverting process uh, and uh, all too frequently getting away with it. We're going to talk briefly later on about the uh, attack on the SWIFT uh, interbank network and uh, into payments that were where uh, the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Bangladesh has recently had to resign over that attack. Uh, a very serious and significant incident for the world uh, and the impact on, uh, on government or central banks globally. So really very briefly then, I'm not going to talk through this uh, slide and mentioning every single one of the, uh, the terms that are there in front of you, uh, but really focusing on the, uh, the right-hand side, the limitations of response. Uh, unless you're a warranted officer of law enforcement or are covered by the Intelligence Services Act in the UK, if you choose to attack another system, be it a criminals or a member of the public uh, or another institution's own system, you are breaking the law uh, under a, a raft of different legislation from the Computer Misuse Act to the Regulation Investigatory Powers Act and so on and so forth. Uh, this isn't a legal presentation, I should add. Uh, the key thing about this is what banks can do to protect themselves and to provide intelligence to law enforcement to enable the criminals to be identified and successfully prosecuted. The key difficulty with uh, law enforcement and the court system in the UK, the United States, mainland Europe and many other Western uh, legislative uh, organizations and, and countries is if criminals are caught, then the legislation all too often is not kept up to speed uh, with the uh, attacks that are taking place. So, over to Andrew. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of time working in the uh, Cabinet Office on uh, looking at the panoply of threats. And, uh, and the slide that you see now in front of you is, is the agreed sort of breakdown of that from an holistic perspe perspective. Now, why is this really important? Well, we we find too often in the press that everything is blamed on poor IT, uh, and, and IT always gets a good kicking, no matter what it is. But actually, from there, you can see there's a lot of human factors, social engineering, phishing, spear phishing, and, and malware. The other really important thing is the terminology used. We find that within various organizations themselves, nobody has a really good defined term for what they mean by cybersecurity. And even sort of talking interdepartmentally, that becomes a problem if you're trying to write and authorize business cases around terminology which you don't agree on. And it gets worse, really, because that varies from sector to sector. And some sectors, like the maritime sector we're dealing with at the moment, have started to make up its own terms, which don't bear any resemblance to anybody else's at all. So getting that and getting a, a lexicon or a lingua franca, which we'll understand, is hugely important. And uh, so I know there has been quite a lot of work done on this, but actually agreeing what we mean by something and getting that terminology, terminology right is really important. So... The people that you need to get the business cases to are obviously the board. They're the ones who are going to sign it up, uh, sign us off. They're the ones who are going to introduce all the changes. And there is good news about how we see boards operating at the moment. Within the UK, a few years ago, we brought in the 10 steps to cyber essentials, uh, so uh, cyber security and cyber essentials. And a lot of organizations have started to adopt those. And that's really good. 92% of the boards understand the critical information assets. Again, what makes that uh, business absolutely unique and what's critical to its survival. And 88% includes cyber risk on the risk register. Now, this is where it comes a little bit unstuck. A number of boards we speak to, they'll say, yeah, cyber risk, number five in our risk register. We say, that's fantastic. And said, so, what is it? And then they sort of start looking at their watches and iPads and thinking that the, the meeting's over. And that's been part of the problem. It has, been the, has really been the elephant in the room. And the other difficulty we have is that people do see... Um, the CIO or the CISOs from the, from the organization. And um, they do explain it. And quite often for some, from, uh, from some of the seniors, we get fantastic chat, obviously knows his stuff, didn't understand a bloody word he said, though. And that is also part of the difficulty, getting the language of the board in place. So this goes into the not so good news. 41% of the boards don't understand supply chain risk. Now, this is, again, really important. And in terms of uh, trends this year, we've seen very much uh, an increase in tax against the interfaces between prime, uh, primes and, uh, and their supply base. It, it's something which um, 
hasn't really been given the attention it deserves and again you know is is a risk only 24% of companies base the discussions on cyber mi for those mature companies we deal with in the FTSE 100 uh, they start each of their uh, board level briefs with one on the financial statement and the second one is on a cyber security statement both internally and externally on the areas again to watch and who should be giving that that's that's again a key point to bear in mind as we talk about the rise of the CISO. Who's, who's that person at the board level who really understands and be able to contextualize it in a business term? And also, a lot of seniors on, on these boards, uh, but only 17% of the members understood their own personal cyber risk profile and about what to do when, when things start to uh, go a little bit wrong and how to manage all the tweeting, the LinkedIn, and everything else that they've been encouraged to do, but actually don't really understand and, and don't really monitor particularly well. So the reason why we uh, talk about threats is because the CISO on behalf of the organization needs to understand the impact of these threats. All too often, banks can't do anything uh, about uh, countering um, the threat by proactive means, as I mentioned earlier. Hackers will hack, criminals will conduct criminal activities, uh, and attackers will continue to attack the organization. It is only law enforcement that can actively go out there and, and working with the banks and with a bank's ability to identify those third parties, act uh, accordingly in a preventative manner. That being said, the actions that a bank can do to protect itself are, are legion. The cost of a, a cyber breach in large organizations, uh, whilst it's in the range of, of 600,000 to uh, about one and a quarter million pounds, uh, as determined by, uh, by recent statistics, it's important to note that uh, employee actions, so internal uh, activity, malicious or not malicious, and system errors are the cause of over two-thirds of all data breaches. Now, many of those data breaches, of course, do not reach the public eye. Many of them are kept internal within organizations, subject to internal inquiries. Worst case scenarios, the media finds out and the share price plunges. The critical word here is the impact. Uh, it isn't necessarily a case of, of hiding dirty laundry. It's a case of understanding that if this, then that. If this attack takes place, what is the impact on our systems? And all too often, as we've seen in the UK, large brand name high street banks have been afflicted by supposed hacks when it's actually been an IT issue and IT downtime. So let's look now at the, uh, one of the most significant issues around competitors uh, and the insider. Whilst there are more uh, Russian and Chinese and other nationality uh, intelligence officers operating in the UK than ever before, the key reason for, for that, and is surmised by many in the, in the profession, should we call it, is around industrial espionage, it's around competitive intelligence analysis, gathering information uh, which is of use commercially as opposed to purely for, for state reasons to do with military or, or other government secrets. The use of phishing and in particular spear phishing attacks, which these are targeted attacks on individuals, uh, so-called CEO fraud, uh, where people write, pretend to be the CEO and instruct their CFO to transfer 100,000, maybe half a million dollars, pounds, euros to an account uh, conducted in a way which is completely and utterly uh, obvious to, to all of us around this, uh, this conference, uh, this seminar, who would fall for that? Many people do, and many chief executives and C-level executives of large banks have been affected by this, causing uh, an impact here is the cause of uh, processes to be altered for better checks and balances on uh, instructional wire uh, transfers. Um, there are lots of terms here, and the, the, the purpose of this morning is not to bamboozle the audience with different terms such as botnets and worms and Trojan horses, but to really focus down there on the bottom uh, picture you can see around people, blackmail, coercion, social engineering, which is engineering information out of people uh, so that they don't know what, uh, what they are doing. They're, they're passing over a password or, or sensitive information without understanding the impact. And of course, physical security too, which plays a part in this. Um, and then uh, again on the insider threat, something which is growing uh, massively as a, a, an area for, uh, for banks looking at this now, is if you look at these four characters, many of their names will be familiar to those of you on this call. Nick Leeson, Jerome Curviel, Kweku Adeboli, and Galen Marsh. Ooh, who's Galen Marsh, you might wonder? Well, the, all four of these people, uh, in particular uh, the, the, the first three, Nick Leeson, Jerome Curviel, and Kweku Adeboli, all of them were effectively IT staff promoted to the trading floor. They knew the back office systems because they helped write them. They knew the ways around the systems to hide uh, malicious or, 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 or otherwise suspect trades. Galen Marsh on the right-hand side uh, was arrested uh, in 
last year, uh, uh, convicted at the beginning of this year. Um, he's uh, essentially uh, pled guilty to downloading information of over 730,000 Morgan Stanley customers. Uh, this has been deemed by the Securities and Exchange Committee, uh, is, is by the SEC in the United States, as being the mother load uh, of cold call address books. This was the information that he was taking. Now, this isn't a malicious trade like Jerome Curviel or, or Nick Leeson who brought down bearings. This was essentially the stealing of an address book. And uh, a large industrial scale address book, but address book nonetheless. This represented for Morgan Stanley the culmination of the value of the business in all of their contacts they developed over many decades. So the, the critical element here is it's not just about financial, uh, about pounds, shillings, pence, dollars and euros being stolen. This is the value, recognizing the value of information. And then, uh, as we see the, the likes of, of Freshfields, Brookhouse Derringer, Freshfields being one of the world's largest law firms now, the uh, slide in front of you has the title, Which Type of Cyber Attack Spooks the Markets Most? And again, we need to talk here about impact. It's this rise of the attack from employees, the disgruntled employee, the accidental action, which causes such massive impact more so than criminals uh, and uh, other external types of, uh, of attack, not saying that those employees aren't themselves maliciously intended, criminally intended. So let me hand over now back to Andrew. Thank you, Edward. Uh, this next slide is, is really just in here uh, to uh, demonstrate all the areas that uh, anybody dealing with the sort of the insider threat from a, from a human, uh, malicious and non-malicious point of view needs to take into account. Now, traditionally, many of those things you'll see there belong in, in HR, but within your organizations, the challenge is, for those who are doing cybersecurity, how much interaction do you have with HR? Who actually owns this process? Who's going to be responsible for ensuring that somebody who comes into an organization is who they say they are and actually behaves appropriately within the culture and the processes laid down? And again, for us, we need to find individuals in organizations who have the necessary skill sets to start melding all this together. And then, of course, in terms of threats, lastly, no uh, sort of presentation would be complete without something around social media and social engineering. Edward's already mentioned um, the number of foreign intelligence service agents we have in this country. It's been quite widely covered in the press, actually. So quite free to say that you know, there are more now than there ever was during the Cold War. They're not all trying to break into your IT. Why would they? They could do that, as we know, from the uh, global nature of IT from anywhere in the world, probably. What they are trying to do is break into the human computer. And... A lot of people don't understand or um, uh, moderate what they put online in terms of their personal. They don't get the privacy settings right. And we've come across organizations where somebody has been, uh, photographs have been taken down the pub, where in the lanyard of that organization. Two years later, that organization has got themselves into a bit of trouble, and that photograph has reappeared. Somebody swigging down an uh, alcoholic drink and said, Company X out drinking while stocks fall or breach happens. And so it's really, really important the social media element, the social media policy is taken into account. So who, who looks after that with an organization? Well, probably comms. And again, are internal comms uh, mixing it up with those responsible for cybersecurity and, and moving the, uh, the whole agenda forward? So again, we're looking for somebody really to take all this on. And that's, you know, it's really, really quite important. And I would say to you all, go Google yourself. Um, we uh, we did Google 15 minutes, a, a CTO from a FTSE 100 company, and uh, we actually discovered uh, virtually everything we needed to know about him to one steal his identity. But also we discovered that his house was empty between three and five every day. Uh, unfortunately, two weeks later, he was burgled, but let me show you, it had nothing to do with us. There is lots of stuff out there about people, uh, and you do need to manage your own footprint. And for the C-suite especially, um, we were talking to one board recently where one of the non-executive directors complained that um, every week somebody else came on to LinkedIn to try and impersonate her to see what she was doing, who was connecting. And again, we need somebody who can talk to the board and support the board and actually um, ensure that um, they understand the risks that they're, they're taking and, and moving forward. And what's the impact? Well, the impact's huge, isn't it? And you see on the slide there, estimated £2.78 trillion uh, pounds to be lost um, and that's what they think the cost of cyber fraud and cyber is. A huge amount, of, uh, absolutely you know, mind-boggling, and that's 100,000 times the budget of the NHS. So that probably puts it into some perspective for you. 
Anyway, I'm going to now move on to uh, Edward is going to talk to you about a, sp a specific type of attack and, uh, and, and how that was actually managed. Thank you, Andrew. The reason why we've chosen uh, this particular attack to discuss uh, this morning is, is one of the key roles of a, of a CISO is to be able to translate some of the more technical aspects of cyber security to an audience whilst not wishing to be patronizing, whilst not wishing to be uh, assumptive in any way, uh, may want to know some of the more uh, prosaic details of an attack without wanting to know the bits, the bytes, and the binary uh, of how it took place. So here on the slide in front of you, you have, thanks to a uh, Kaspersky infographic, something about the Carbonac uh, attack, which some of you may be familiar with. Essentially, what happened here is this was malware, uh, malicious software, a virus effectively, that was uh, infected on a machine, but looking for something in particular within a system of systems. So rather than... Uh, uh, copying your address book or doing something like, uh, say, Angry Birds and opening up your uh, smartphone or your kid's smartphone to, uh, uh, to the camera and the microphone or whatever it may be. It is a particular attack on an organization to allow a uh, entry of a four-digit code, a PIN code, if you like, uh, into um, susceptible ATMs, automatic telemachines, uh, particularly in, in Europe, but actually it was an international attack uh, that allowed a criminal upon entering this four-digit code for the, essentially for the ATM to empty itself of cash. Um, the flaw was well known about. Uh, it's well-documented vulnerability in the ATM network, and the criminals exploited this. Um, the, the key thing with this was the, uh, the malware was looking for administration rights for uh, automatic telemachines within the networks of individual bank uh, systems. So as I say, system of systems, a global connectivity across ATMs. So we all know uh, these things are all, all reliant on technology, which is uh, quite old uh, and is take, taking a lot of time to, to be updated. Law enforcement tends to be focused on uh, what is, is termed in the industry as cash out, how they got the cash out, who received the cash, what they were doing with it, uh, and essentially, law enforcement was trying to get to the kingpins, but uh, whilst the uh, Carbonac attack has resulted in a number of uh, people, approximately 12 people have been now arrested to do with this, law enforcement is very aware, as are the banks, these are small fish. These are the recipients of the stolen cash out of the ATMs. Um, all I can say on, the, on this call is that law enforcement are not certain they have got the gang behind this. Uh, you may choose to read into that uh, what you will. The key thing about this was the uh, criminals exploited a known vulnerability. So the, the wound was gaping and open, uh, ready to be, uh, to be exploited by the criminals in this particular attack. So understanding some of these vulnerabilities and translating this to a board is one of the key roles uh, of the CISO. Recently, and uh, incredibly recently, this was published on a Monday this week in the Evening Standard in London, the uh, Chief Executive Bill Winters of Standard Chartered has launched a, a crackdown on some of his internal staff misbehaving. Uh, quote, he's been disappointed and angry, unquote. Um, he's written a staff memo to staff, quote, I am concerned that a small number of employees, including senior managers, have willfully disregarded policies, sometimes for personal gain, and set a poor example for their peers and teams, unquote. Essentially, this was around uh, senior bankers, they have been fired since, uh, failing to tell uh, others about unlicensed investments and, and so on. But essentially, this also includes uh, uh, malicious activities where staff were trying to do things behind their peers, behind their managers' backs. Uh, essentially, looking at, at these range of different threats, uh, everything from uh, unlikely, being unlikely to detect a sophisticated attack, threat intelligence, not having a, a security operations center. A lot of things are areas which, forgive me, may be seen as detail, but are very, very important to the CISO to manage on a daily, weekly, monthly, on a very regular basis, and report as appropriate to the board uh, with a minimum of, of uh, usually a twice annual formal presentation to the board. So now moving back to Andrew, who's going to talk to you about uh, cyber trends. Uh, the slide in front of you um, shows the cyber trends for 2016. Um, we're in danger of giving this CISO a red cape and red wellies and telling him to fly around the world, but this is something else which he also has to deal with, and that's the, the hugely changing uh, cybersecurity landscape over um, one, new, uh, one million new bits of malware per day. And, you know, 
two years ago, who'd heard of the term ransomware? It wasn't in our common vernacular. Well, uh, so far it's been reported that 3,500% increase in ransomware in quarter one of this year alone. So the threats change on, on, um, on the, every day. There's something new coming up. So again, whoever Arsiso is going to be or, or how he gets there, he, he needs to understand and adapt and be agile enough to ensure that the organization that he is helping to defend can be agile enough to take into account and to overcome a lot of the trends we're seeing. So the other one which really isn't on there is the, is the supply chain, which again, I think is uh, very, very important for this year. So in terms of what the CISA has to do, really, really important that he understands this landscape and builds in processes and capabilities to be able to address changes in this landscape. So. The $64,000 question is, what is a CISO for? Many organizations don't have a, a CISO, but most banks do. Uh, the result of, uh, uh, of a chap called Philip Katz inventing uh, the CISO term in New York uh, uh, approximately 20 years ago uh, is the result of having somebody whose shoulders, uh, upon whose shoulders the security of the bank uh, relies. And the crucial thing is the I here. Many organizations had a chief security officer uh, of one form or another, whatever the job title may be, for, for many years long, well beyond the 20-year time frame. The key thing here is the chief information security officer, aligned often with the chief information officer, the CIO. The chief information security officer has a responsibility, of course, to make sure the company's customers and others' information is looked after, safeguarded, but crucially, to be, enable its safe exploitation, to enable the information upon which the organization relies, customers and other third parties relies, is used, not overly protected to the point where it becomes useless. The CISO is also there to have a public role, and my colleague Andrew will talk uh, in a moment about that and how different organizations have used the CISO or not used the, the CISO role as a way to uh, safeguard uh, others in the organization from public scrutiny. All too often, particularly in the North American market, but internationally now, the CISO is uh, sometimes seen as a scapegoat. And actually, one of the things that Templar has discovered over the last couple of years, working with central bank CISOs and uh, retail bank CISOs and others, is that uh, a CISO can protect him or herself from being that scapegoat, from being that public scalp, by undertaking a few very simple measures, and effectively not only... Uh, maintaining public confidence and that of customers, but actually maintaining the board's confidence in him or herself and in that role. I mentioned earlier the need for the information in an organization to be exploited, and this is that third bullet in front of you about business opportunities. Security has uh, often be, tried to be uh, launched on organizations as security is the enabler. Security lets you do things. Try and counter a culture of security means no. What was the question? Actually, in this day and age, you try and using your mobile phone without security. You try using your laptop without security. It's there and it's baked in. The industry, from a technology perspective, has learned. So the CISO is there to create, lead, and contribute to a culture where security is absolutely hard and fast part of the wiring in the organization. And some of the best banks we've uh, encountered and worked, had the privilege of working with is where security is not seen as a disabler, isn't actually seen as an enabler, but is there at the back of the mind uh, and very much part and parcel of what the organization does. And the piece about beware of the bull is very much the, uh, the term of, of BS, but also to beware of too much hyperbole around cyber. Cyber is a threat like any other to the business. It is a business threat. So understanding uh, the roles in many organizations, in particular in banks, you'll see there in front of you uh, a, a very simple organogram stylized to describe where often the chief risk officer sits on the board. He or she may be a uh, sole risk officer, chief risk officer or may wear a hat alongside another such as the CFO, the CEO or the COO. Uh, but really one of the things that we found works very well in organizations is having a board member who owns information risk at that board level often because the CISO, as you'll see a couple of rungs down, is uh, a little bit removed from the board, and that oftentimes we see CIOs and others are not part of uh, the board construct. So the CISO is there on the, or not, excuse me, on the organogram in front of you as a couple of rungs down, running a team of compliance and audit specialists, policy standards, procedures, guidance, and other areas where a CISO has a responsibility. But I'm going to hand you to Andrew now, who's going to talk to you about where the role of the CISO is going in an organization's hierarchy. 
Thank you, Edward. As you can see, um, in that particular hierarchy, uh, he isn't very high. And I would uh, reiterate Edward's point is that quite often the people at the Chief Information Security Officer aren't on the board, aren't on the EAM, the EXCO, and actually a little bit further down than that. Um, so therefore, it's not having the impact that, that we really need to see. Also, we need to have this good lingua franca that actually the board needs to understand, needs to understand in good business acumen and, and good business language what to do about the problems, what to invest in, have a look at the return on the investment. So uh, our man here, the CISO, needs to be able to write, and we see him moving up. We see him moving up this, and actually we, there are already some organizations where CISO is a board member uh, at the executive board at the ESCO and therefore can actually provide that type of level of advice and join up between the business, the technology, the people, the processes, and the culture, and the board to make sure that the board fully understand everything that's going on and all the risks they face. Edward's now going to talk a little bit more about, now we stop coughing, about, about the CISO. Forgive me, I, uh, I swallowed some water the wrong way, wrong pipe. Um, so the CISO we've already discussed is responsible there for establishing and maintaining confidence but a deep understanding of the organization's cultural vision, the strategy uh, of, uh, uh, of the organization, and instilling that within that strategy, the security delivery arm of the bank, of the organization. Some of you may have come across this term information assurance before. Uh, information security, cyber security, uh, uh, information assurance. Essentially, they're all different sides of the same coin. Uh, they're all really at their heart the, the same thing. Uh, a lot of the activities we see and, and have experience of uh, fault and, and, and challenge comes around uh, when it, it's looked into as policies being out of date, employees acting to the letter of policy, but the policy is not valid, it's not up to date, it's not easily communicated, and sadly is often not written in, in plain English. The wonderful thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. So if you choose to be standardized to level X or level Y with standard Z or whatever it may be, uh, that's great. Now, as, we've, uh, uh, as we see MIFID II being rewritten, as we see different standards from the International Standards Organization coming out, uh, news about the United Nations and the control of the Internet, uh, there are different ways that we can choose to do our business. The key thing is to have that lingua franca internally within the organization, as my colleague Andrew has mentioned, developing that lingua franca internally so that expectations are set and, crucially, there are no surprises. Um, we've also got areas around architecture and operations there. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read uh, the slides out uh, to you. But in addition, you've, you've got, uh, now there we go, uh, a slide change to uh, the CISO, managing business continuity planning and disaster recovery. It isn't just an IT issue. A number of banks we've had uh, the pleasure of working with have demonstrated their business continuity plans and exercise to us, and they are good at the technology level. Often business continuity and disaster recovery, crisis management, tends to leave out the most important aspect, which is, of course, people. You can have all the best technology in the world, the greatest padlock on your front door, and the best security in the world, but if there's nobody going into and out of the building because of X situation or Y scenario, what is the, the, the point in all that technology? Network and application penetration testing, pen testing. Again, this is pro proven to be an important part of compliance requirements, for example, for the FCA here in the UK. However, who is doing what with the pen test report? The CISO's responsibility is not just to have the pen test conducted as per requirements from a regulator, but to follow through with the recommendations that are made, prioritize accordingly, and act in terms of producing a business case to produce a budget signed off by a board in an acceptable fashion from an investment appraisal or whatever the process may be to ensure that what gets done needs to get done and what needs to get done gets done. We all understand the tautology. So moving now back to, uh, to Andrew. I'm delighted to say we've had a number of questions in, and uh, hopefully Edward's answered the first one there, what are the skills the CISO needs to possess? And hopefully this, this, um, this next slide will so, sort of answer who is the CISO. Well, for us, the CISO needs to be somebody who has and understands risk really well, uh, has a background in business and really underneath some sense commercial thing, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, from a, a point of view of education, 
needs to really understand and get this space. But from our, for our perspective, they can come from any of those channels, business, commercial, technology, HR, security, and delivery. And the idea of a CISO is that he needs to be a jack of all trades. In fact, he almost needs to be a master of all trades and really understand how they interact um, and work together to produce uh, what the organization needs. And as Edward said, you know, this is the person who, who should be looking after the vision, should be looking after um, uh, the cybersecurity strategy, making sure it's implemented. Um, how does the CISO stay uh, one step ahead of the game to ensure they meet the varying demands of the board is another question we've had. Um, well, he or she uh, needs to do that uh, through um, through actual ownership of, of the problems and staying, staying one step ahead. You're going to get so many interesting feeds of intelligence and getting the right KPIs in place that actually if you do get that in place, you, you can move forward and you can stay ahead of the board. What keeps the CISO awake at night? Well, actually, this will uh, probably tell you what keeps the CISO awake at night and hopefully you can hear the music playing. Um, nobody wants the news at 10, a moment of any sort of description. Unfortunately, this particular organization did have a news at 10. And actually, um, despite, despite everything said, uh, profits uh, had fallen, um, and it's just coming up here, profits have fallen um, by, uh, well, the whole thing cost them 42 million. Let's not beat around the bush. And 100,000 uh, accounts. Why was that so? Well, something which was, um, the whole crisis wasn't managed properly. And a well-trained CISO who seemed would be there for business continuity, would understand, would understand what's happening, would steady the board with the right language. And also, if your CEO is going to go out and talk about it, then actually you know, make sure they are properly briefed. They do understand all the issues. But wouldn't it be good to have a CISO on the board who could go out and speak about it, who could bring together all the different sort of elements, answer any question that any bright journalists could be able to ask around this space to offer that reassurance. And perhaps if that reassurance had been offered when uh, the Radio 4 interview was done, when the television interviews were done by somebody like a CISO, then perhaps the, uh, the, the stats and figures we see there um, you know, from TalkTalk Talk, you know, may not have actually occurred. So it's, it is definitely, definitely something to think about. So how do we pull it all together? Um, what does best practice really look like? Well, in terms of holistic cybersecurity, I'm just waiting for the slide to load. Um, the CISO needs to help organizations understand its business outcome and what assets are important. Enable the board to have really good board level ownership. Make sure they understand the, of the language, make sure that they understand all the information risks, cybersecurity risks they're running. Ensure there's a fantastic information risk management uh, process around that. And last of all, enwrapped in a very, very positive culture to ensure that the company really knows what it's doing. And actually, at the end of the day, it has to be that holistic approach. We come across too many organizations that unfortunately just concentrate on one aspect. And that one aspect may be the IT, or they may be harmonizing terms and conditions. But at the end of the day, people will find workarounds. People will um, subvert the process. As I would uh, read out that newspaper cut, uh, cutting it on uh, from a very... Um, disgruntled uh, boss of a bank. You know, people are finding ways around. They're not following the processes. So 24-carat solution, no. Moving everything together in a holistic manner, yes, very much so. And again, just moving on, it's not all about the IT. And again, this is where the CISO... So the target, um, the target case is one which is used a lot. Why? Because the IT actually within that aspect worked absolutely perfectly. The monitoring worked absolutely perfectly. What didn't work was the integration between what the IT was telling people, what the processes were, and human decision making. And again, the CISO, in our view, actually spans that bridge, is the place uh, where the human element and the technical element can come together to actually make um, a significant difference. Target has probably cost around about um, one billion dollars so far, and of course, it's lost uh, most of the board their jobs. So again, very very important. And trust in that brand? Well, who knows? It probably won't recover. Uh, we're talking a little bit about sort of the IT element as well. Um, for us at Templar, we've seen quite a lot of successful introduction of hybrid solutions, again, which is something which the CISO would know about, where the CISO has actually moved to take those critical information assets, which really are important to the organization, and taken them off the uh, general use of the IT. So if you, if you use cloud, like uh, um, Office 365, for your, for your general management, those typical assets which are really, really key to the success of your company have, have been removed.
Thank you, Andrew. So just in brief, one of the key things we've been asked to, to do is to give an idea of what the CISO can do now today. What are those action points? What's practical? An understanding of standards is important. There is no necessity to, to, to know every subparagraph and bullet in a standard, but understanding across the board what those standards actually mean, not just to the bank, but to your supply chain. The CISO, he or she has a responsibility to ensure that the bank can stand on its own two feet, yes, but also being part of that supply chain means that the bank on occasion may not be able to stand up on its own two feet without rigorous supply chain assurance, as Andrew talked about earlier. I talked earlier also about defense and response, the ability to respond and limitations around that. Often the response is build a bigger wall, dig a deeper ditch, and actually that's not a bad methodology from the perspective of, of electronically what can be done. But governance and leadership still maintain a very important, very significant part of this because the CISO, he or she cannot do it all. They need the faith from and in their boardroom colleagues. They need the ability to lead men and women in the organization to undertake activities and to take responsibility, each and every one, for security. The use of independent audits from organizations to understand what is the actual as opposed to the perception uh, within the organization. Um, one of the uh, key areas which uh, smaller organizations, smaller banks will find uh, of interest is how to copy the success of, of larger banks, for example, and here is a, 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 a shape on enterprise response. An enterprise response doesn't mean a multinational bank. It doesn't mean a major high street bank. An enterprise response means a way that the organization can respond in a good business way, in a tried and tested good practice way to enable the organization to act uh, in, a, in a way that doesn't surprise the board. Then moving ahead to uh, improving information security, every bank, no matter its size, can do more around the HR vetting and training of its staff. Improving the culture of the organization so that you don't actually need to say, we've got a strong security culture. You can merely say, we've got a strong culture because security is very much part of that culture. Governance, again, forms a very key part of this, uh, and the ability to uh, pull in uh, board members to act as sponsors and seniors to enable activities to get done uh, is a key part of, of the CISO's role. And as Andrew mentioned earlier, allying technology with the business is a very key skill for a CISO to have, to be able to understand some of the technology, not all of it, to understand some of the standards, not all of it, but to enable the CISO to translate, for example, between the technology side of the bank and the business side of the bank, to translate from the deep technology, the bits, the bytes, to the boardroom and vice versa. I think we're just going to whiz through um, a, a, a slide. Um, the one key thing that whether you're large or small, you need to be able to make the business case uh, to the board for the investment, the necessary investment in the cybersecurity agenda for your particular organization. And to do that, you need to look at the return on investment. We have a signature company we've worked with who investment of 30 million have managed to, in their view, uh, we're around about 7.5 billion pounds worth of business by getting and maintaining a certain level of cybersecurity maturity across, uh, this is an international company, across a whole range of dis dis uh, different disciplines. Why? Because they've made a business out of it and they've seen it from a business perspective. So you need a good strategy, though, to help you do that. And on, in front of you at the moment is, uh, our, in our view, um, ways to get a decent strategy looking at getting your leadership and governance right, culture right, information risk management right, Make sure there's a life cycle about creating, utilizing, destroying information, um, audits and compliance, um, and other cyber-specific aspects, whether you're going to monitoring, what your type of monitoring is, whether you insource that, outsource that. And there's definitely a life cycle within organizations that they will choose at different points within that life cycle to adopt different solutions. But each one needs to have that return on investment. For too long, too many of my colleagues in this space have been turning up to boards and scaring the bejesus out of them. And that has a negative effect in the end. They'll turn around and say, well, actually, there's nothing I can do about it, is there? So why should I care? In our view, a far sort of measured approach is actually to talk about the return on that investment, what it's trying to ameliorate, uh, what risk it's trying to ameliorate against, and actually then convince the board in the board's own language so, so they understand 
uh, what's what's going on. Um, we've covered a lot today, and thank you very much indeed uh, for your attention. Um, the one thing in life which never changes uh, is that we have to deal with people. Uh, you don't come across such things as a malicious computer. Now, sometimes in the morning, we all feel that the computer is being particularly malicious, and, and some people, in some extremes, it ends up in the bin or out the window. But actually, it's people who program computers, and it's people who use uh, all the IT that we have to prosecute their business, and sometimes they do it well, and sometimes they do it badly. Challenges, what keeps a CISO awake at night, is one of the questions asked. Well, perhaps something like this will keep the CISO awake at night as well. Uh, hopefully a short video is just about to play. Oh, let's try again. And it's great that the government is working on this, but the truth of the matter is, we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves. You know, so hopefully you'll be hearing this in your ears. In the United States is password one two three, and as long as we're as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password, and <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name my and dog's the year name. I graduated from high school. What kind of dog do you have? I have a small Papillon. And what's his name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. But, and so you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland, one, two, three, four. Gemma, one, two, three. Spell G-E-M-M-A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like so what, like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. Well, hopefully you, you found that as amusing and perhaps a little disheartening as we always do when we watch that. But uh, it, it just brings, uh, brings home the, uh, the point about uh, the human interactions. I have a question. Do you anticipate the rise in CISOs uh, becoming CROs, given their broad range of skills, uh, and CROs uh, coming from more of a technology background? Uh, I think the answer to both those is yes. Uh, we certainly do. Um, interesting enough, the British government, um, depending on Brexit, is going to be issuing a new um, cybersecurity uh, updated version of 2011. And, and, it, and it looks very much at having um, not so much a CSIRO at the top of the tree now, but to all effects, uh, to, uh, in all aspects, really, uh, a CISO. Uh, somebody who understands all aspects of security, but also business and business risk. So, yes, we do see that uh, moving forward and those taking place. And I said already, we have already come across one bank who, who has argued that they, they have already promoted um, a CISO up, up to board level. So, another question we've had is the somewhat uh, bold and, uh, uh, and challenging question, is the CISO a thankless job? Uh, in a uh, in summary, it is up to the CISO. Uh, I've had the I've been a CISO myself of a, 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 a large public listed uh, organisation. Uh, I've worked with CISOs across the world, and what uh, what marks the CISO out is what marks any senior executive out, uh, and that's an attitude of proactivity and willingness to get the job done. Uh, and whilst that may sound like a trite uh, way of answering the question of is the CISO a thankless job, the CISO job is what you 
uh, make of it. It's very much uh, a case of, as I said earlier, gaining the confidence of the board and the trust of the board in doing a good job. Uh, and really, uh, the CISO sometimes has in the past been a scalp put on public display to demonstrate to customers, to partners, to shareholders as the reason why this attack happened, the reason why this all went wrong is because of this individual. Uh, and I think all of us on the screen appreciate the market in general has matured since those days. There will always be uh, an organization which chooses to do that, uh, but it's demonstrative of the immaturity of the organization rather than the individual concerned. Professionalism is everything, uh, and the CISO taking a, a forward-looking view, working with a senior sponsor on the board, or being that senior sponsor on the board, going back to the question that Andrew answered earlier about chief risk officers, uh, CISOs being promoted to be chief risk, chief risk officers, it, it's very much a case that this is a board-level requirement uh, for understanding of security and actions around security, uh, particularly around the information domain. And indeed, we've already seen uh, chief security officers uh, become, uh, or sorry, forgive me, CISOs become chief security officers, losing the eye of, of, of the CISO, uh, despite them doing 99% of their job is around the information in the organization. Because if you like, some of the physical aspects of security, some of the personnel aspects of security have become commoditized. But there I go back to a slide I used earlier, and uh, words I said earlier, there's always room for improvement. And the CISO is very much a thankful job when, uh, when the CISO saves and demonstrably saves the bank from oblivion. Oh, we've just got a further question here. Are banks with CISOs um, more protected? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, yes, they should be if the CISO is the right person doing the right job. As we heard earlier on, the CISO came out of the States, and uh, we met many uh, CISOs from the States who, who uh, basically came out of app development um, and consequently didn't really know too much about some of the HR. And why we focused on the, uh, on the inside of the threat in this presentation was, was to bring out the point that actually a successful CISO needs to understand um, all the impacts of not doing that HR job correctly in terms of security and in terms of information security and also the, protecting the organization. And they has to do, and she has to do, that really, really important job of melding it all together to come up with an integrated approach, an integrated plan, which as I said, you know, you can see what the return on investment will be in that plan to move it forward. Just appointing somebody a CISO from one day being, um, you know, car park attendant CISO the next isn't going to obviously protect your, uh, your bank or, or anybody else for that matter, or, although he may be a bit quicker about handing out the tickets on the cars. Uh, the, the whole point of this is they need to be properly trained. Um, of course, we would say this, but we have uh, the only uh, GCHQ uh, certified course in the UK for CISOs, and we specialize a lot in bringing these people up because they are the future. They are very, very important indeed. And and just to add to that, uh, there are a lot of lessons learned from, from history, uh, but also there are lessons forgotten. When, uh, when Steve Katz in, invented the CISO role uh, back in 1995 at Citigroup, as I said earlier in, uh, in New York, uh, the concept was very, very nascent. It, 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 as I say, he invented it. But it was a direct result of a Russian malware attack. Bear in mind, this is 1995. Uh, 20 odd years ago with the development, massive development in the last two decades of, of technology dependency by banks. The NYB concept mirage attack, so again, without going into too much detail of the bits and bytes here on this, this seminar, uh, Steve Katz was very much uh, credited by uh, Citigroup saving uh, what was then still one of the largest financial services institutions in the world. And what he does now on the board of, of Financial Services Information Sharing Analysis Center in New York is very much a, uh, uh, very much a, 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 a governance role, if you like, uh, for financial services in New York. We don't have the equivalent in, uh, in the UK. Um, just one, uh, one final question, perhaps, for, for, for this morning uh, has been, uh, can we explain how botnets operate and what their purpose is? Um, a botnet is a, a compound word. It's a, a network of robots. Those robots are computers which are taken over uh, by a third party, usually a criminal. Um, interestingly, the, the history of, of botnets really owes itself to, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. An application was written uh, in the 1980s to uh, use PCs in offices 
during quiet hours, during dark hours, for the, quote, legitimate, unquote, uh, search for extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. Um, the concept of using computer power rather than using supercomputers is simply a way of, of uh, harnessing uh, computers to undertake activities on a very large scale without, as I say, investing in uh, massive infrastructure such as a, a Cray supercomputer. Well, fast forwarding now to the 21st century, uh, the uh, massive rise in, in distributed denial of service attacks, which can now be bought as a service for as little as $5 per instance on, uh, on the dark web, on the dark market. Uh, the botnet is something which is uh, all too often used by criminals uh, uh, to undertake activities on our machines using our resources at home or at work uh, without us knowing anything about it, the hidden processes that go on behind uh, uh, these uh, are, are benign IT activities of surfing the web or using email or whatever it may be, and we just don't know about it until we get our, 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 uh, our bills or, or indeed we, if we're lucky if we do get to know about it. The key thing about the, uh, the use of, of botnets is it's again become, I use this word uh, advisedly, it's become commoditized. The ability of criminals to uh, target individuals or generically launch uh, spam emails with malicious software where you click on a link or you click on an attachment uh, is being used to uh, allow the criminal the ownership uh, in, in hacker jargon. It's spelled P-W-N for own. Uh, ownership of, uh, of your computer or your family's computers or your colleagues' computers in order to, uh, to use these activities. Sometimes these criminals are what are called hacktivists, again, another compound word of hackers and activists, who may not require, a, uh, may not have a financial agenda, but are ideologically motivated, uh, such as uh, the infamous Edward Snowden, or otherwise want uh, some uh, nefarious gain. Over to Andrew now to, uh, to wrap up. Thank you. That was uh, very comprehensive. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for, for your attention today. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed hearing about what we think the rise of the CISO would be. I think for every organization, it's absolutely vital that we make the connection between what people are doing day to day in their workplace and the board. So the board can fully understand in board and business language what risks they're running and how they're running it and what the organization can do uh, to ameliorate those risks. And for us, the CISO will, is already playing a, a big role, but in the future will play an absolutely critical role. And we think somebody with the CISO schools, uh, skills at the, uh, the board level will be absolutely vital going forward to always um, meet the challenges of the current and future cybersecurity landscape. Uh, thank you very much again for your attention. I'm going to hand back to Philip. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Andrew. That's been very, very informative indeed. I think this is um, just the, <laughs> we're touching on um, on the basics here, and I think that um, this is just a stepping stone in what um, we are going to be developing alongside Templar as well. Um, what we've got is, um, with Templar executives um, next month is a half-day GCHQ certified training, um, which we think is essential and really mandatory training for your colleagues in the bank um, called cybersecurity, what every bank needs to know. I will send you details alongside the on-demand webinar, which we'll be sending out shortly um, within the next couple of hours. Thank you very much for your time today and have a great day. Bye-bye.